morning. Phyllis Glazer on behalf of the defendant's appellants, the Louisiana Attorney General Liz Merle, Colonel Robert Hodges, the Superintendent of Louisiana State Police, Chris Eskew, the Deputy Superintendent of Louisiana State Police, and James LeBlanc, the well-known Secretary of the Department of Public Safety and Corrections, all of whom are sued only in their official capacities in this case at this point. The, <clears throat> the plaintiff, Kendra Greenwald, is a registered sex offender who filed suit claiming a substantive due process violation. She claimed she had other claims that have since uh, been dismissed or are being considered at the district court level. Ms. Greenwald's substantive due process claim is originally pled was that she has a disability which prevents her from complying with the sex offender registration and notification requirements <clears throat> under Louisiana law. And that because she's incapable of complying with them, she has a fundamental liberty interest to not be arrested for violating them, even though she admits that it is a felony to violate them. Um, that claim is heck barred um, because Ms. Greenwald was convicted of failing to register and at the time of her conviction she claims she was disabled and as a result of her disability incapable of complying. It is a direct implication to the invalidity of her conviction based on the operative facts of her current uh, her current 14th Amendment claim as compared to her conviction. Um, Seems like her complaint is with regard to compliance with a condition following her conviction. Uh, what's the best case that we can look at to make that fall within the heck umbrella of claims that are barred? Well, she, um, so she, she changed her claim a little bit uh, in response to the heck, so the facts, the operative facts of the complaint. And she still um, admits that she is a sex offender. That's never been put at issue correct in, in the proceedings she just feels as though she cannot comply based on her whatever disability her current dis right so so why is that heck barred what, what's the best case again that makes that fall under heck well heck it's I mean all of the heck case, I mean it's a let's see you've got the line of cases recent cases um, involving excessive force cases so Oquan and those types of cases where you look at the fact, the operative facts of the uh, 1980, the current 1983 claim before you, compare them to the uh, the crime she was convicted of. So she, according to the complaint, she was convicted of failing to register. Um, she had her probation first. She had her probation revoked for failing to register, but she also was convicted, subsequently convicted on a new charge of failing to register. According to paragraph 67 of her original petition, page 25 of the record, she began having difficulty complying with SORNA almost immediately after becoming subject to it. Thus, she has admitted in her complaint that based on her disability and the resulting limitation, she was incapable of complying with the registration and notification requirements from the get-go. So if you find that she has a right now because she's incapable of complying, um, a fundamental right to not be arrested, it's going to Im imply the invalidity of her uh, prior convictions for failing to register because she was allegedly disabled then. Um, it is a, I mean, the, fa the operative facts are the same. Um, even though she claims her uh, condition has gotten worse, the thing she was unable to do originally, she is still unable to do. Um, and so in response to Heck, she, she changed the claim and said that the current claim doesn't imply the invalidity of her convictions because the current claim arises from a finding by one of the judges at Orleans Criminal Court that she is uh, a permanently and unrestorably incompetent to stand trial. But as the district court found, her competence to stand trial is not relevant to her compliance with SORNA. It's about her ability to, to stand trial for any crime. So you referred to the original complaint and now an amended complaint. But what are we hearing in this appeal? Only the original complaint. Is that a problem for this appeal? It is not. Um, it is not because the substantive due process claim, which is the only one before you right now, was not amended 
by the amended complaint. And so the judge's ruling on the original complaint stands, even though he fought, they, even though she filed an amended complaint afterwards. We're talking about an appeal from a complaint that is no longer in existence. Correct, but the court's ruling is is fixed, and so even if we filed, it may an, sound like a very technical question, but we've dismissed appeals based on these technical defects before. Correct, but you've also um, found that if a Dozat is one of the cases that comes to mind was an Eighth Amendment medical indifference claim where if the operative facts are the same um, in the original complaint and then subsequently and you don't appeal the ruling based on the original set of facts, then you, it, you've waived it, you're stuck with the court's ruling. So what we have right now is a- Which, which case is that? It, it's, call, it's called Doza, D-A-U-Z-A-T. I don't have the citation in front of me. But um, that's just one that comes to mind. So we've got a ruling based on the facts as, as pleaded in the original complaint that the complaint states a cause of action for a substantive due process violation that none of the named defendants are entitled to, to sovereign immunity from. It overcomes heck, it overcomes sovereign immunity, the ex parte young. Um, and, and then on a different claim, plaintiff was granted leave to amend, a procedural due process claim. Um, and so the amended complaint doesn't touch the substantive due process claim at all. And You're saying in that case, the NOA was based on the original, no longer existent complaint, it was but a, our court a, still heard the appeal? It, it, actually, in that case, it was there was a, an appeal from the, um, it was a 12B6, and that was, um, let's see, it, it, it was a qualified immunity case. 12B6 was appealed and the denial of qualified immunity was affirmed and MSJ was filed and the court found it's the same set of facts on, a, in the, the, um, on the MSJ as was in the complaint. So same, it, that was the holding on the You're second that appeal. That appeal was premised on the original complaint, not the, the new complaint. The facts as alleged in the original complaint that were subsequently proven on summary judgment, yeah essentially. And so it was the same set of facts both times, and thus the court said it's the same. The result is the same. Um, and, and so we, to avoid that, and we, we checked too, and there's, a, um, there's an email confirmation in the record to make sure that the substantive due process claim wasn't touched in the amendment. And so we, we have this ruling here. Now, if um, I, if you were going to say that we couldn't appeal because there was an amendment or that the appeal was moot, made rendered moot by the amendment, the timing is a little, I'm not 100% sure, but um, that th within your purview, uh, if, that, if that is what you think should happen, but we would ask that you say that so that the defendants can come back and re-urge this later because this collateral order well, appeal yeah, this, is- This certainly doesn't prejudice your, uh, the, the state's assertion of rights in any way, shape, or form. This is a technical problem, it's, but sometimes lawyers get technical. The case I'm thinking of is New Orleans Association of Cemetery Tour Guides, uh, uh, I'll just give you the site, 56 uh, F 4th 1026. So if you all think that that case is somehow distinguishable, uh, obviously welcome uh, 28J. Okay, I will certainly. Um, but that's, that's, it, this is a technical problem that will not uh, prejudice and either side's rights to vindicate uh, any arguments they want to appeal. It's just we have to have a, a, a valid appeal sure, before we can hear of it. Of course, um, jurisdiction uh, is, you know, a big, it was a big issue here and the procedural um, intricacies of this case have been um, unusual at times as well. So I, you know, I get it. Um, so, uh, but assuming that we're here um, on a valid appeal, uh, the, the amendment doesn't actually touch this, so um, touch this claim. But so now, now the claim, uh, now the, the substantive due process claim pertains to this finding of unrestorable incompetence. Now, Ms. Greenwald was arrested only one time after being declared an unrestorable incompetent. Um, the 
the language used in the complaint is a little vague about that, but it's been clarified. It's unequivocal in the uh, briefing. She was arrested only one time after being declared an unrestorable incompetent some four years before suit was filed, and that was about seven years ago, at, as of June or July. But, um, it'll be seven years. Um, and so that claim, it, to the extent that it's based on unrestorable incompetence, that does not meet the ex parte young exception, <clears throat> excuse me, as to any of the defendants. Um, for one, there's no ongoing constitutional violation. She was arrested one time after being declared an unrestorable incompetent and not by any of the defendants, not the state defendants or the city. Uh, he, she, according to the complaint, I think was arrested by Jefferson Parish, which is not even a party to the suit. Um, and, and only the one time. So there's no allegation of an ongoing issue here with her being arrested after being declared an unrestorable incompetent, one time. Then there's the defendants. So she was not arrested by the state ever, according to the complaint. Uh, and so the allegations of, of this connection, this ex parte young connection between the named state officials and the act. According to the original complaint, the connection has to do with their respective involvement in uh, enforcement and the administration of the sex offender registry and the registration requirements. But if the claim is about um, the finding of unrestorable incompetence, then the connection of the defendants to, to, of the state to enforcement of SORNA is irrelevant because if she's incompetent to stand trial, she's incompetent to stand trial on any claim. And if the fundamental right, the, the substantive due process right, is the right to not be arrested at all because she is incapable of standing trial, then the most you have here is a group of state officials who have a general duty to enforce criminal law, and that is not enough. Um, to connect them to the enforcement of the act for purposes of ex parte young. In addition, as Ms. Greenwald has said several times in this case, she's not actually challenging the constitutionality of SORNA in the way that you know, one normally challenges the constitutionality of an act. She's challenging her arrests. Now, her arrests for violating SORNA happen to be about violating SORNA, but as we know, as has been admitted, she's been arrested for other things, including a sex offense. So um, th again, the, the defense, so you don't have that ongoing constitutional violation or the connection with the defendants um, to meet ex parte young. And then there's the question of the injunction. The injunction that is requested is an injunction. Do we which we still have the injunction at issue here? I understand in the district court, maybe your opponent can address this, but I, my understanding was that the plaintiff no longer seeks injunctive relief. Oh, no, I think they're only seeking injunctive relief still. Um, and it's an injunction to uh, still to prevent her from being arrested. And I believe they added an ADA claim, and so I think that there's an injunction um, for accommodations that it, it can't be against the state because they don't do what they're asking for, but I think against the city. Um, and, and on that note, uh, part of what the defendants had moved for originally was a more definite statement. It was very, very clearly um, raised in the motion. So it was a 12B1, 6, and E. And um, the district court didn't rule on it at all, and now it was rendered moot effectively by denying the motion as to this claim. But the issue of the more definite statement is really significant here because even though there has already been an amendment, there wasn't one on the substantive due process claim, which was the basis for the motion for more definite statement. Um, the, the claim is so vague and, as we've seen, is now fluid and changes depending on what uh, argument they're responding to. Um, and a more definite statement would be appropriate here because that threshold question of what legal standard is going to govern analysis of these claims is the threshold question. Um, it's one you, that has to be answered in every 1983 case as the first question because otherwise you can't 
inquire as to whether there's an ongoing violation without knowing what the violation is or how the defendants are connected to it um, or any of those things if you don't know what constitutional right is at issue and what legal standard governs the claim here. So Ms. Greenwald is alleging an unconstitutional arrest and that is a Fourth Amendment issue and not a 14th. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. You've saved five minutes for rebuttal. Mr. Edmonds. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Chris Edmonds on behalf of Kendra Greenwald. With me at counsel's table is Dalton Corson from Disability Rights Louisiana. Um, Judge Ho, I want to first address the jurisdictional issue that you raised because, frankly, I had not even considered it until you raised it this morning about the uh, original complaint and the amended complaint. <clears throat> we did uh, amend our complaint. The, the original uh, complaint, the only com claim that survived was a claim for injunctive relief against the state of Louisiana uh, for a violation of substantive due process. Subsequently, we amended um, and the, there was motions to, dismile, motions to dismiss filed and Judge Malazzo has denied the motions and is basically the ADA claims are going forward. And um, so those I hadn't put a whole lot of thought into this issue, but I do. I am familiar with the case law that says that once you file an amended complaint, it supersedes the original complaint, and the uh, original complaint is basically of no legal effect anymore. So obviously, this court has an obligation to consider jurisdiction sua sponte. We will happily submit a 28J letter on that issue. Um, my friend on the other side spent the better part of her argument talking about the Fourth Amendment. But there's that she's trying to argue the merits of the substantive due process claim. Under Ex parte Young and Verizon, the Supreme Court's Verizon decision, that you cannot get this, there's a threshold analysis is, is, is the term that they use. And that threshold analysis does not include any examination of the merits of the claim. You literally, it's literally, you look at the piece of paper and you say, are they alleging a violation of federal law? Yes or no. You don't get into a 12B6 type analysis. It's this very superficial level of analysis. Um, and, I, and to give you an example. But I take it that's what the state is saying is all you need is a superficial analysis no. to know that this fits within Fourth Amendment the more specific enumeration of the Fourth Amendment over the substantive due process. No, that's, so that is, that's, um, that's not what they're saying. What they're saying is... Certainly one of their theories, I think, isn't it? They, they, they may have other arguments, but isn't that one of them? No. Their, their argument is that under Ex parte Young and Verizon and all of that progeny, that this court has the authority to engage in more than a threshold analysis and can actually look, well, what is the the constitutional right at issue. You say it's substantive due process, but that's really Fourth Amendment. That is way, way beyond ex parte young territory. Ex parte young is, is are you alleging... Pres if you're agreeing that's their argument, you just don't think it's allowed under... Uh, yes, yes, maybe, 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 sorry, maybe we're ships passing in the night here, Judge. I, I, that is their argument. You're saying sure. that is not superficial enough to, to right. do it this Right, correct, way. thank you, okay. yes. All right. And I would say more importantly, they never raised this argument in the district court. And we, we in, our, um, in our appellee brief, we say, I'm sorry, where was this Fourth Amendment argument in your motion to dismiss briefing? And in their reply brief on appeal, they say, oh yeah, we raised this argument. Look at page 233 of the record. We raised it. So I went and I looked at page 233 of the record. That's their reply brief, your honors. They raised the, this Fourth Amendment argument for the first time in their reply brief in support of the motion to dismiss. It is very well established that you cannot raise issues for the first time in a reply brief. Was there an argument below or was it just on the no, papers? It was just on the paper. You mean an oral argument? You're right. No. In other words, you didn't have a chance to engage. Correct. No, the ju Judge Malazzo did not hold any oral argument. So we had no opportunity. You're it wasn't preserved below. Correct. They did not preserve this issue. Um, and that's why we didn't address it. <laughs> if you end up going back because this appeals moot, then you can have fun down there. It, sure, that's right. And, and they, they can, they will take up that issue of whether assume, or not. I assume they'll raise it uh, next time. Right. <clears throat> um, I'll turn to Heck um, if there's no 
further questions about that. Um, well, actually, I'll, I will just, just briefly address the merits of, of the Fourth Amendment issue. We may also have a Fourth Amendment claim, but they don't dispute, they, they don't explain why we also don't have a substantive due process claim. And they, they concede that being physically arrested and jailed is, implicates a liberty interest. Um, they may have, they may dis, and, and maybe in fairness, maybe I'm missing something here, but I'm trying to get a picture of how this is going to work. Assuming you're successful, you get an injunction, you know, PD, it covers them, it covers JPSO. D does your client carry the paper, in, the written paper in her back pocket and show it when she's arrested? Or does she have it, you know, a, a yeah. thing pinned to her shirt when she goes out where the police know, well, yeah. here comes, here comes Ms. Greenwald and yep. don't mess with her. Yep. How does she, offer up some immunity. Uh, it sounds like she wants immunity from being arrested for not complying with SORNA. I understand well, that's the goal, but as a practical matter, I just don't know how this could be implicated. Yeah. Her, her, why is she not, why does she not avail herself of the lack of mental capacity? Uh, granted, it's no fun to be arrested, but if she would have the claim that she doesn't have the mental capacity, just as has happened in the past. Um. Well, the problem with what you're suggesting is that for her to raise that claim, she has to first be arrested. And so she's in this vicious cycle where she only gets to raise the issue of her mental capacity after she's been arrested, after she's been so jailed. Tell me how, <laughs> well, how does she, does she have it you sure. know, stenciled on her forehead? Yeah, or no, how do we know I don't, so not to arrest I understand the question. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on this because now we really are getting into the merits of the claim in, in terms of how you would um, frame and how you would craft the injunctive relief. And it's a very fair question, Judge, because this is a very unusual case. I don't think this is something that happens every day. It is. <laughs> okay, most criminal laws tell you not to do something. Don't kill, don't, don't steal, don't rape. This is a law that affirmatively requires you to affirmatively do something, and not just simple things, very complicated, arcane tasks that would be difficult for myself or the judges on the bench, frankly. So um, it's an unusual situation. But uh, that is a question for the district court, uh, and, and that is a, 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 a question that when we get to the injunctive relief phase. And of course, it is not right, because now we have an Americans with Disabilities Act claim, which actually puts an affirmative obligation on state entities to accommodate people with disabilities, including in the criminal justice context. Um, so I'd like to move to the HEC, because I know I'm, I'm, my time is running short. HEC only applies to convictions. We are not, nothing in our complaint uh, challenges any prior convictions. We're not challenging her initial conviction for SORNA. We fully concede that Ms. Greenwald is subject to SORNA. We are just saying that she needs help complying. The, the Orleans Parish Public Defenders were helping her for a while. They cut her loose. They said, we can't do this anymore. Myself and Mr. Greenwald have been helping her. But that's not our job, right? And so maybe they have an argument below. Maybe they'll convince uh, the judge or the jury below that, no, that's really, there's not a claim here after we get some discovery. But we're not challenging her conviction, nor are we challenging her uh, one failure to register conviction in uh, 2014. We are seeking injunctive relief moving forward. And in fact, the best evidence that we're not seeking a HEC claim is the language of HEC itself, right? Because HEC says, and this is at page 487, when a state prisoner seeks damages in a 1983 suit, the district court must consider whether a judgment in favor of the plaintiff would necessarily imply the invalidity of his conviction. Damages, right? We are not seeking damages. We are only seeking injunctive relief. That is a very strong clue that nothing about the relief that we get will imply the validity of any. Not against the state defendants. Is that? I'm, I'm oh, sorry. I'm still. No one. So we we initially. I don't know where we are on the injunctive relief. That's why. I so have... yes, uh, our claims. We no longer have any pending claims for damages. All of our claims are the only pending claims are claims for injunctive relief against the city and against. The, the state defendants. And of, and of course, this, this kind of gets into this, it's, SORNA is a very, diff, you know, the, the obligations under SORNA, the, the governmental obligations are very diffuse, 
right? It's not just one agent. But don't we have case law that says that <clears throat> injunctive relief on this type of claim would not apply if the state is not in specifically enforcing it against the Well, yes, state. we do. Yes, let me, let me, can I? The general obligation sure. to uphold the law. And can I, can I turn, can I answer your question? Do whatever you want in your time. Yeah. I'm just, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm going to, absolutely. Honestly. Yes, Judge, I'm going to get to that. me, please. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, let me get through my heck argument, and then I will turn right to your, that, that's more of the ex parte young argument, and the Paxton, Austin v. Paxton case that we cite. So, the, you know, that's, the, the first issue is that we don't, you know, we're not challenging her convictions. We're challenging her arrests without convictions. She keeps getting arrested and not getting convicted because she is it been deemed irrestorably incompetent to stand trial, and no one seems to dispute. And when we get into discovery, no one is going to be able to dispute that Ms. Greenwald, because of her very severe functional limitations, is not able to comply with this Byzantine requirements uh, under SORNA. So, heck, does not apply. The second thing I will say is this court does not have the jurisdiction to consider heck issues. Now, I know that there's the Poole case, right? And ba basically in Poole, I think it was Judge Costa who went back and looked at the case law and he said, this is a mess. We've said multiple times in unpublished opinions that heck issues are not immediately appealable. And other, so that's the prevailing view in other circuits. And that, of course, makes perfect sense because there's no reason that a, a heck determination cannot be fully adjudicated on appeal after a final judgment. Right, but they said we've got this case, Sappington, and it's a published opinion. Even though there's not really any reasoning explaining why heck issue should be uh, appealable, and so under the rule of orderliness, we're bound to follow it. However, both Poole and Sappington are easily distinguishable because both cases arose in the context of qualified immunity against individual officers seeking money damages. And we are not seek seeking, we're not suing anyone in their personal capacity seeking damages. We're only seeking uh, injunctive relief against officers in their official capacities. And that matters because qualified immunity is immediately appealable. Because if you are forced to respond to discovery requests and appear at hearings and trial, well, that, that eviscerates qualified immunity, right? And so the, I think the court in, in those, uh, the, the, this court was saying in those cases, all right, we're already here deciding qualified immunity. We're going to address heck. So I, I think the way that you can limit the scope of Sappington and Poole is to say that really only applies in the context of uh, appeals from the denial of qualified immunity. And to the extent that you, you don't do that, we, of course, preserve that issue for en bloc review because we do believe that, that the Poole and Sappington line of cases, cases is wrongly decided. Um, that said, you know, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Heck because, <clears throat> oh, well, before I do, Judge Oldham's dissent in Crittington v. LeBlanc, which we cite, he talks about this, right? Because they did the panel did not consider Heck the Heck issue because it was not briefed on appeal. Uh, but he goes through all these cases and he says we have considered Heck issues quote in this posture, and this is uh, he says. Yes, our court attempted to cure this conflict by stating that heck issues are reveal, reviewable on interlocutory appeal from a denial of qualified immunity. So I know that that's a dissent. It's not binding, but I think it is instructive. Judge Oldham's basically saying that heck issues are, are immediately appealable when they come up to this court from the denial of qualified immunity. But even if you do have jurisdiction to consider heck issues in this posture, all you need to do is look at Poole and Sappington, and you can clearly see that this doesn't apply. So in <clears throat> Poole, for example, the court said that heck is no barrier because the excessive force claim was temp temporally and conceptually distinct from the flight offense, right? Whereas in Sappington, the criminal conviction necessarily implied that the officer did not use excessive force. There's nothing about finding that uh, Ms. Greenwald's rights are being violated in some way now, going forward for prospective relief. Nothing about that would invalidate her prior convictions in the past. So with that, I will turn, Your Honor, to your questions about Ex parte the Young and the connection. So first and foremost, this this case law, it's a little bit funky, but 
you really only need to have a scintilla of enforcement. And the Austin v. Paxton case says, and I quote, the text of the challenge law need not actually state the official's duty to enforce it, although such a statement may make that duty clearer. Well, the text of the statute here could not be any more clear, that the attorney general and other, the other state defendants have a very clearly and extensively articulated duty under the statute. Now, we also have to show a demonstrated willingness to enforce that, and we have done so. We have alleged that on numerous occasions, uh, the attorney general has <coughs> not only issued um, opinions on the scope of SORNA, but has in fact gotten directly involved, used the very unusual authority of, of saying, we're going to actually directly prosecute and take over this, this prosecution. Uh, in addition to that, it's not disputed that the, the SPAT, um, the, the Sexual Predator Apprehension Team, um, is very actively involved in, in enforcing SORNA. I, 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 can't, I don't understand how they can deny that. And of course, they don't deny that. What they now have done is tried to change their argument and say, there's no evidence that Ms. Green, excuse me, there's no evidence that SPAT was involved in Ms. Greenwald's arrest. Well, that is not what Ex parte Young requires. And that would, be a, that would turn Ex parte Young into dead letter because Ex parte Young is about prospective relief. They're arguing about things that happened in the past, right? The, so uh, the fact, we, that's the first thing, right? That, that, that doesn't, um, excuse me, I'm having a brain freeze. The, that's not the scope, right? The scope of Ex parte Young is whether or not you have a duty and a demonstrated willingness to exercise that duty. You don't get into looking at individual plaintiffs. If, if that were the case, no, almost no one would be able to sue under Ex parte Young because you would have to show that this individual, if I want to challenge the FDA or something on a, on a new drug regulation, I would have to show that the FDA actually uh, enforced something against me in the, in the past, right? Um, so... That's the, the second thing is that they didn't raise this issue in the district court. This, this argument about we have to, we, the, the attorney general's office and these other state defendants, have to have actually interacted with you, nowhere in, in their briefing in the district court. The, the, third thing, <coughs> the third thing is that we have no way of knowing that question. We, they may well have been involved in Ms. Greenwald's arrest, we don't know because there's all sorts of ways that the Attorney General uh, can be involved in enforcing SORNA, including identifying people without physically carrying out the arrests. So if, if this court is inclined to accept the argument that we have to sh show some personal connection between Attorney General, former Attorney General Landry and my client, then we're entitled to discovery, some very you know, narrow jurisdictional discovery on that question. But of course, that is not the law under Ex parte Young, and it was waived. So you don't have to reach that issue. Um, the other state defendants did not raise this sovereign immunity issue. They raised the same argument, right, that, oh, we were not physically involved. They don't dispute that they have a duty and a, and a demonstrated willingness to exercise that duty under Ex parte Young. They simply say, uh, well, we weren't personally involved. You, you don't allege that we were personally involved. Again, they didn't raise sovereign immunity at all in the district court. And what this court has done, this court does have the discretion to consider sovereign immunity arguments for the first time on appeal, but this court's general practice is to send those issues back to the district court to pass on the issue in the first instance because it's really not fair. It's gamesmanship. You, you try to challenge the, the claim on the merits, and then you lose, and then you appeal, and you say, oh, I'm going to raise sovereign immunity. That's, that's just not fair. Um, that, that's not a fair way to, to litigate cases. And so that's, unless there's some really pressing reason, like if we were really threatening the coffers of the state of Louisiana or something, um, that's, that's the type of issue that should be sent to the district court to consider in the first instance. I have about a minute left, but um, I don't believe I have anything further. So if the court doesn't have any questions, I thank you for the court's time. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. I'm sorry, Ms. Glazier, you have five minutes reserved. While the plaintiff has uh, 
conceded she's not entitled to money damages against the state officials in their official capacity. Um, Her well-established Supreme Court precedent, she's nonetheless trying to hamstring the state of Louisiana into not arresting a sex offender for violating state criminal law. Um, That is an injunction that seriously implies the uh, implicates federalism principles and the sovereignty of the state of Louisiana. Um, the issue of sovereign immunity was undeniably um, wa- raised by every single state defendant, and it was unquestionably denied as to every single state defendant under Ex parte Young. That's in the district court's opinion. Um, so that issue was not waived. This is there's no gamesmanship here. What we have is an um, arguably indefensibly vague complaint um, where the complaint keeps changing. So there's a a comment about the Fourth Amendment issue not being raised until the reply on the motion to dismiss stage. This was a 12E. There was a 12E motion for a more definite statement, part of the motion to dismiss, and specifically on the substantive due process claim, which was then changed a little, clarified a little bit in opposition to the motion to dismiss, which then prompted a reply. The motion to dismiss just so happened to have been filed twice, fully briefed twice, and, and considered, well, It was under advisement in the middle district when the case was transferred to the eastern district. There was plenty of opportunity, notice to the plaintiff and an opportunity to respond to that argument. There just hasn't been one yet. Um, The, uh, let's see, um, individual, the connection to the individual plaintiff. Nobody is saying that Jeff Landry or Liz Merle needed to be involved personally in anybody's arrest. And that's not, nobody's ever said that. Um, but the Attorney General's office has not been um, involved in any of Ms. Greenwald's arrests, nor has State Police or the Department of Corrections. Um, and there's no issue with her, regis- her appearance on the website. Um, so why the deputy superintendent is sued is anybody's guess. Um, but that's not the issue. The issue is that she is not seeking an injunction to declare SORNA unconstitutional. She, this is, as she, the word she used was an as applied challenge, as applied to her. So this is where you have some overlap between sovereign immunity principles and Article Three standing, and um, which has been raised, has been briefed, um, and Article Three standing in this case, she can't just sue arbitrary defendants who might have some connection with enforcement of a statute, she, there has to be some connection to her when the injunction is specific as to her. Um, so, for example, if she was going to ask for some you know, special ID that has to be printed by the Department of Public Safety, well then, you know, the public, Department of Public Safety might be the right defendant, but she's got to have, you know, there's got to be some connection here, and there's not with the state. She was arrested by the parish, or by the city of New Orleans, the par- Jefferson Parish. Um, there's no connection here with the state. Sovereign immunity is immunity from suit, just like qualified immunity. It is immunity from trial. It is immunity from discovery, as I know y'all had it. Um, arguments earlier this week on that issue. Sovereign immunity provides those same protections to the state, the state officials who are being sued, um, because even though it is, you know, this fictitious official capacity personhood thing, um, they are still people who are going to get yanked out of their jobs as the top law enforcement officials in the state of Louisiana and subjected to discovery so that they can figure out what connection they have to her so that they can craft an injunction later, none of that is allowed. Sovereign immunity, there, there has to be this, this legal connection. And she does have to have standing in order, and it's a you know, redressability issue, standing to sue the people she's suing, whether they're actual people or they're fictitious people, as the case may be. Um, so I think with that, um, y'all must be ready for your weekend, unless you have any other questions. All right, thank you. Thank you. The case is submitted and we are adjourned.